theyeshiva.net. Today, I'm going to focus Be'ezer Hashem on one of the great uh, staples of the Pesach Seder known as the Four Questions or the Manishtana. Next week we're going to focus on a general theme that pervades the entire Seder, but today I want to zoom in on one specific aspect of the Seder, which is usually the most exciting for children, and that they prepare for days, some of them weeks, and some of them even months in advance. At first glance, it's just a very simple ritual. The Torah commands and instructs the Jewish people to tell the story to their children. And thus the structure of Pesach is structured around a conversation. A conversation of questions and responses, questions and answers. And the text of the questions made it into the Haggadah, so it's not just random questions, although that is always, not just uh, spontaneous questions, although that is always welcome, but also these fixed questions known as the Manishtana, in which the children ask and the adults supposedly answer. The question I want to raise to you is, not four questions, but one question, and there may be some more questions, is, as children, did any of you ever get an answer to the four questions? Huh? <laughs> Exactly. All we do is we employ a classic Jewish method, and that's called distraction. And getting you so exhausted from the story that by the time we're done, either you forgot your question, or you're not interested in an answer to your question, or you give up on ever having an answer to this question. But it's really an interesting phenomenon. Your child innocently says, or whatever language it's being communicated in. I'm just doing the Egyptian language. Father, I'm going to ask you four questions. What makes this night different than all other nights? And then the child, the girl, or the boy explores four items, four particular components that make this night different than all other nights. Different Haggadahs, by the way, have somewhat different versions of the Haggadah and different orders of the four questions. A very common one is, you start with matzah, you go to marer, you go to dipping, and you go to reclining. Although I know some here have a different version, a different order, based on the Jerusalem Talmud, Talmud Yerushalmi, and the Arizal, and Rab Amram Gon, who have the order of dipping, matzah, Murr and reclining. But whatever the order, which order do most of you have? The first or the second? The first. Regardless of the order, the message remains the same, and I'll follow the first order since I assume that's the majority of people sitting here have that order, so we won't get confused. So the first question is What makes this night different than all other nights? All nights we eat chametz or matzah. Leavened bread or unleavened bread. And tonight, only matzah. The second question is, All nights we eat various vegetables. Tonight we have the mitzvah to eat marer, bitter herbs, bitter vegetables. Comes the third question. All nights we don't dip, usually even once. Tonight we dip twice. We dip the vegetable, the karpas as it's known, whether you use a potato or an onion or celery or whatever people use as a vegetable in salt water. And the second dip of the bitter herbs, the marer, the bitter vegetable, <coughs> the romaine lettuce or the horseradish or whatever people use for their bitter herbs into what we call the charesis. And the fourth question is, Did I do them well? Okay. All nights of the year, we had practice for many years. All the nights we sit either reclined, or either sitting or reclined. Tonight, we are all reclined. 
And in many communities, the custom is, the tradition is, the child finishes and says, Tata, Chabadig, if recht for kashas, yeah, it's bitter, give me that teretz. I asked of you four questions. Now please, I'm awaiting your answer. Now imagine throughout the year, your son comes over to you, your daughter comes and says, Mommy, I have four questions. First of all, your ears will perk up. And they ask four detailed questions. And instead of a response which they ask for, you give a sermon which goes for the next two or two and a half hours. So we tell the child, let me tell you a story. We were slaves to Pari in Egypt. Okay, we're getting somewhere. And Hashem took us out with a strong hand, with a strong arm and a stretched out hand. And by the way, if he wouldn't have taken us out, we would have still been there. Which also needs explanation what that exactly means. Okay, wonderful. So now we're out. So why do we dip twice? Tell me again. Tati, mommy, wait. The story that happened in B'nai Brak. <laughs> and now we really, really digress. And if that's not, that's not, not enough... We start blessing God for giving us the Torah. And if that's not enough, we start talking about four children. <laughs> Even though he didn't, have, he wanted to know why we dip twice. Can you tell me why we're dipping twice? Why we're reclined? Why there's no chametz? Why there's murder? And actually, we never get to answer the question. The four questions... I mean, if you know the whole story and you know a lot of other details and you learned it in school before and you learn after and you learn a whole year, you probably know the answer to the questions. But there's no ordinary answer to these questions. It's one of the very strange components in the Seder. Among many other strange components in the Seder, you know why it's so strange? So that you should ask questions, right? <laughs> it's difficult to understand. The truth is the whole structure of the Seder is a difficult structure which I'm going to elaborate on next week, Bezer Hashem Bli Neder, I'm sure my plans are at the moment, but I want to focus today on the four questions. There's something else. If you look at the four questions, they don't really seem like four questions. They seem like four answers. Think about the text. What makes this night different than all other nights? And then the child goes on to explain exactly what makes this night different than all other nights. He tells you, or she tells you, a wonderful, they actually give the answers. <laughs> Maybe that's why we don't need any answers. They give a wonderful exposition of what makes this night different than all other nights. Who said this night is different than all other nights? What makes this night different? They tell you exactly what, it make, what makes a difference. Tonight you will not find any chametz in the home. We will eat only matzah. Tonight we will be eating the strange food called mara. Tonight we will be doing these two dippings. And tonight we will all be sitting in an irregular fashion, all reclined. So yes, the child didn't explain, Lama nishtana halay hazah. Why? But the child did explain, Ma nishtana halay Ma means what? Lama means why? Madua. What makes this night different than all other nights? I just told you four things. So a real question of ignorance is what makes this night different than all other nights? You're telling me it's going to be a special night. Tell me what? And then you might answer what will make this night different. We're going to go here, we're going to go there, we're going to do this, we're going to celebrate this. Here, the very four questions, they're called four questions, but really, there's only one question right in the opening. And then the rest of it is really an answer of what makes this night different, quite detailed. It's not all of the details of the answer, because as I said, it doesn't say why, but it still says what. And we call it the four questions. Now one might say, you don't have to uh, get so uh, meticulous and obsessed <laughs> in the details of these four questions, it's just a child asking four questions. But that's not the case. Because this text comes from the Mishnah. In other words, it's a text that was created by the sages of yore. And therefore the text has, as all their texts, layers upon layers of untold significance. 
and on different layers of interpretation as well. Physical and metaphysical. Material and spiritual. Practical and psychological. Concrete and emotional. It's interesting, at the time of the Beis HaMikdash, there was another question asked. As the Mishnah brings, that each night we eat various types of cooked foods or roasted foods. Tonight it's Kuloi Tzli. Time of the Beis HaMikdash, they had the Passover offering, the Pesach sacrifice, lamb or goat meat, which had to be roasted with a spit on top of the fire. It couldn't be baked in an oven or cooked in a pot or even a fire roast, a, a, even a pot roast, roasted in the pot itself by its own juices, wasn't allowed. It had to be literally on the fire, direct contact with the fire, not through a, a vessel, a keli, a pot, or even an oven. So that was a, another component that was asked. But obviously after the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, and that component of the Seder was taken out, even it, though it was the highlight called Pesach, because of the Passover, the carbon Pesach, the Pesach offering. So that question was eliminated, and we have these four questions that we have today. But these four questions have profound significance to the point that Darizal, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, Rabbi Isaac Luria, who lived in the 16th century, in the 1500s, in Tzfas, and is considered one of the greatest mystics and Kabbalists in the history of Judaism, says that the four questions correspond to the four worlds. There are four worlds discussed in Kabbalah that parallel our universe. There's the world of Asiya, the world of action, the world of concreteness, the world that is manifested in physical images that we inhabit. There are three higher worlds that we also inhabit, but for that you need more subtle uh, lenses to be able to experience the vibrations of those worlds, known as the world of Yitzira, formation, the world of Bria, creation, and Atzilah is the world of oneness, intimacy. And he says the four questions are really a progression through these four worlds. He does it in his order, which is based on Talmud Yerushalmi, dipping matzah, mar, and reclining, where dipping is the experience of the world of action, and matzah, the experience of the world of formation, and mar, the world of creation, and the highest reclining, the world of Atzilah. All of this to indicate the profound significance, both on a literal and on a spiritual level, of the structure, the text, and the significance of these questions. So today, with God's grace, I want to present one aspect of it, at least one aspect of this. Indeed, our children are not only giving us questions, they're also presenting us with answers. And as usually in life, David HaMelech says in Tehillim chapter 8, from the mouth of infants and sucklings comes profound strength. From the mouth of babes, that's the expression, comes from Tehillim, chapter Ches, chapter 8, Psalms 8, from the mouth of the children often come the profoundest wisdom and the profoundest answers. The greatest lessons in life we can often learn if we have the patience and the courage to listen to our children, what they say explicitly and what they intimate between the lines. And if you can listen to their silence, then you can really learn a lot. What makes this night different than all the nights of the entire year? What makes it different? What sets it apart? One might say, well, it's a Yom Tif, it's a holiday. We don't work, we have new clothes, we clean the house, we have a Seder. Everything is different. There are guests, there's excitement. Some people are stressed, everybody is exhausted. But the question is, those are all the containers, the kalim. But what about the light, the ur, the energy of the seder? One of the challenges we all have, and this is a challenge whenever you institutionalize something is, it can become mechanical and devoid of internal meaning and inspiration. Very often, people become so overwhelmed 
by the technical details, they don't have the mental space or the serenity or the emotional wherewith to be able to be present and experience something. And it's important to understand this because when one um, experiences Pesach or really any other Yom Tif, we have to allow ourselves and give ourselves the, the permission not to become overwhelmed with just the responsibilities and the duties and the details, but to understand that that's a preparation for an internal journey. Now it's easier said than done, it's easier said than done, knowing all the preparations that people do for Pesach, beginning with the cleaning, which itself can become quite a stressful experience. And then there's the food, the preparations of the food, and the shopping, and the cooking, and preparing the seder, and preparing the house. And then when you have to buy new shoes for all of the children, or the grandchildren, or whatever else, everybody's preparations for Pesach, B'Sha'a Toivo Metzlachas. And yet, you also have to be able to respect yourself and your relationship in this process. People who feel that the Yom Tif of liberation is about them becoming slaves for everybody else to be free, it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't make sense that the holiday of emancipation and liberty happens at the expense of a few individuals who have to feel like how do you say that in English? <laughs> That's for Sukkot. Any translation? <laughs> Have to feel completely, completely depleted of any amount of energy and vitality and stamina and joy so that people could sit like kings and recline because they're kings. And other people feel mamish like slaves who are still subjugated to Pari in Egypt. If that's our experience of Pesach, you have to press control, alt delete, take out the old CD from the brain, and revisit everything. It's time to erase the hard drive and the software and recalculate everything because something is off. If we are not allowing ourselves to enter into a Yom Tif, which is actually about freedom, it's about liberty, which does come with work <laughs> and does come with hard work, but it's accompanied with an internal sense of meaning and joy and purpose. There's something in our Judaism that went horribly wrong and sour. And people become allergic to this ultimately people who are open with their emotions and with their selves, it becomes very, very difficult for them. That's why it's so important to focus not just on the external details, but on the internal message. And remember that if something is not perfect, it's perfect. We sometimes become so neurotic about everything being in place that ourselves, we cannot be there. And that becomes very sad. So the question, is a deep question. What makes this night different? Not just technically. What makes this night different? What opportunities does this night provide us with to give and create a true nishtana, from the word shinui, a true change to the better in my life? What is it that's going to happen or that could happen on this night that can make things different? It's just another night, the clock moves, another Pesach, another Yom Tif, more food, more food, 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 nonstop. This one, this type of food, this one, that type of food. This one doesn't touch Gebrocht, this one is Mahadeh and Gebrocht. This one peels everything, this one is allergic to peeling. This one stops, doesn't touch anything. They won't eat even because anything could be chametz. And this one is so psychologically traumatized, they don't stop eating. Even things they won't eat a whole year. Lady fingers and macaroons and all the schmerling chocolates and everything, they won't stop binging on a whole Pesach just to heal themselves 
from the traumas of Pesach, so we have to overeat in order. But bo, bo, the question, is there an internal energy this night? What is it that makes it truly a part, truly different? Because from a Jewish perspective, the Arizal says on the Pasuk in the Megillah, Hayamim ha'elen is skarim v'nasim b'chol dar These days are mentioned, commemorated, and done in each generation. He says, what does it mean they're commemorated? I know, what does it mean done? And he says that in Judaism, a Yom Tov is not a commemoration. Rather, time is considered sometimes cyclical, which means every year when Pesach comes, the same energy that existed in the universe on the first Pesach again vibrates through the cosmos, and if one opens their hearts, they can access that energy. And through that, they're actually reenacted. So even though the physical circumstances may not be here, we're not living in the part of the world called Egypt, at least most of us, and physically leaving Egypt, but the energy of freedom that was available that night of Zman Cheresein was available each year, each year on Pesach. On this, the child gives us four answers. He says there's four things that make this night different than all other nights. The first component is, All nights we eat chametz or matzah, tonight we eat only matzah. The difference between chametz and matzah, of course, is chametz is inflated dough, and matzah is deflated dough. It's flat. It's true on a physical level, matzah is not challah. It's also true on a chemical level, that when bread is allowed to leaven by using yeast, as we spoke last week about yeast, sourdough, or just allowing it to inflate with time, the enzymes are released that actually create a chemical reaction that leaven the bread. They transform the chemistry of the dough. Matzah doesn't allow that process to happen because it's baked prior to that process. And as a result of that, this is more flat. It's deflated. Which, as we know, represents on an emotional level or on a psychological and a spiritual level, the difference between arrogance versus humility. The inflated ego, which is represented by chabetz, and the deflated ego, the humble human being, represented by matzah. You could see it even in the letters. It's interesting the closest thing to become chametz is matzah. There's no chashash chametz like the chashash of matzah. All the fears of eating chametz on Pesach don't come close to the problem of eating matzah on Pesach. Because matzah essentially is on its way to become chametz. Rice and corn are not chametz the products. They're kidneys. <coughs> Fruits and vegetables, sugar and oil, are not chametz the products. Yes, Jews, certain communities, certain families have been stringent in many, many of these products and processed foods, and especially what happened by the Ashkenazim with Kitneus, that the fields, like the rice fields and other legumes, were right near the wheat fields, and they often got mixed up, and therefore the Kitneus legumes were forbidden in the Ashkenazic world for Pesach, things like rice, etc. But uh, the greatest concern for Chametz is... Matzah, because it's about to become chametz. Another few minutes, it becomes chametz. And if the flour, part of the flour is not baked, if there's a particle of flour that's not baked in the oven, and it gets wet, it could become chametz, which is the reason for the stringency. Those who are very careful with gebrucks of not making matzah wet, because if it's baked already, it's not a problem if it becomes wet. Bread could become wet, no, no chemical reaction. But if there's a particle or particles of flour that are unbaked in the matzah, and sometimes unnoticeable. Therefore, they're afraid that if it gets wet, it could become chametz. So the greatest concern for chametz is matzah. Making matzah is the greatest problem. But we don't have a choice. There's a mitzvah to eat matzah on Pesach. So when you look at the words, in Lashen Kodesh, everything is meticulous. The words are very similar to each other. Matzah and chametz are literally almost identical. Matzah consists of three letters, mem, Tzadik, hey. Chametz also consists of three letters. Mem, Tzadik, and Ches. Which are the two letters that are different, but they're the closest to each other in the Hebrew alphabet? Ches and hey. 
Reish and Dalet also. But Ches and He are very close to each other. They have a roof. They both have a roof. And they have two walls extending vertically. Right? You remember the Ches? There's a horizontal roof. And two walls extending vertically downwards. The He also has a roof with two walls coming down. But the difference is, the He, the left leg, has space between the top of the leg and the roof. Where in the Ches, the two legs connect to the roof and there's no space whatsoever. Both of them have a space on the bottom. There's an opening on the bottom without any blockage. And there's only three lines. One is completely open. But the Ches, the two legs are connected to the roof and the He not. So Mem Tzadik is exactly identical. Matzah, Mem Tzadik, Chametz, Mem Tzadik. The difference is by matzah, the mem tzaddik is in the beginning. By chametz, it's at the end. And the next difference is the he versus the ches. Chametz versus matzah. And he and ches are almost identical. Because physically, matzah and chametz are almost identical. They're both bread. Here you left it for 26 minutes, 25 minutes, 19 minutes, whatever the shear is. And here you left it for 17 minutes. So the difference of one, two, three, four, five minutes... Hey, you put in a little yeast. Hey, you didn't put in yeast. It makes the whole difference between chametz and matzah. Essentially, physically, they're identical. But spiritually, there is also a connection. And that is, in life, just like in the ches and in the hay, everybody, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody falls. That's why there's an opening on the bottom. The Gemara says in Masech de Menachis, in our world there's an opening. People fall. The only people that don't make mistakes are people <coughs> that you don't know. People, so <laughs> somebody once told his wife, I made a mistake only once in my life. It was back in 1961. She said, what? He said, I thought I made a mistake. In life, everyone, there's an opening on the bottom. The opening on the bottom represents that sometimes I fall. That's not a question. The question is what happens afterwards. This is the difference between the ches and the he. The ches, you fall, and there's nowhere to climb back in. <laughs> the ways are sealed from all sides. And the he, there's an opening on the top, the person could crawl back in. Because the question is not if I mis make mistakes or I don't, if I stumble or not, if I fail or not. There's no human being, the Pasuk says, Shleimah Malach says in Kaihelis, in Ecclesiastes, ain't sadik ba'aretz ha'shayasa toivalayach. There's no righteous person in the world who does only good and doesn't sin. And yechta doesn't only mean sin, the more accurate translation of chait is, as we have in the Navi, about Shaul HaMelech, his uh, arching, ab his abilities of shooting, his ability to shoot arrows, koileya el asayre veloi, yechta. He aimed perfectly and he never missed. Basheva tells David Amalek, her husband, ani ubni shloima Your son Shloima and I will be chatoyim. Chatoyim don't mean sinners, chatoyim means we will be lacking. Chait means avoid in Hebrew, which is really the concept of sin. The real translation of sin is not sin or transgression. The real translation is lo yechta. It's missing. There's a void. There's a cavity, there's a hole. When a person, what the concept of a sin is, a person is acting out of a void. As we spoke last week, I have a certain void, and I want to distract myself from that void. So I try to fill that void, and when I do it, I only create a deeper void. Chet means a void. And it starts off with the letter Ches. So when I, I fall... I fall, I fail. Ain't tzaddik baritz filo yechta. People miss. We're imperfect. Even the greatest people, as a result of the fact that reality is imperfect, there are things that we miss. So chait could mean literally sin, or on a deeper, more subtle level, it means there's a void, there's a lacking. What happens afterwards is the most important. In the personality of ches, which is the chametz personality, I fall, but then I don't know how to say I'm sorry. I also don't know how to take responsibility. I also don't even know how to acknowledge mistakes. Three things. Some people simply cannot acknowledge that they make mistakes. It's below them. 
They'll always blame others. They'll always cover up. They'll always have excuses, rationalizations, justifications. They'll always blame the world and play victim, or they don't even have to do that. They'll simply live in la-la land. They can't acknowledge there was any error. Even if they have to acknowledge there's an error, they'll blame somebody else. Even if they can't blame anybody else, they don't have the courage to be able to apologize, to say, I'm sorry. So they remain stuck in not rising back up and coming back into the game of life. Like the Ches, they fall and there's nowhere to climb up into. Matzah represents humility. Humility is the ability to be able to be open to all possibilities. And the greatest possibility to be open to is the possibility of growth. And the possibility of growth only happens by acknowledging where I am today, where I was yesterday, and where I could be tomorrow. So the humble personality is not the personality who is smaller than the arrogant personality. The humble personality is much larger than the arrogant personality. The arrogant personality remains completely stuck in their own orbit. They're not capable of introspection. They're not capable of listening to criticism. They're not capable of growth. They're always defensive, more defensive, more defensive. You can't even have a normal conversation with them because they always have to protect themselves, which usually comes from a tremendous amount of insecurity and tremendous amount of inner, an inner void, a hate, which makes them feel that if they confess a mistake, it's akin to death. And therefore they have to defend their fool, sometimes very foolish, foolish behaviors, literally to the point of insanity. With a matzah personality, I fall! but I crawl right back in. There's an opening for me between the left leg and the roof. I come right back in. I'm back in life. And I fall again, but I crawl right back in. So a person makes mistakes. The only thing you have to make sure is two things. Number one, try not to repeat them. Make new mistakes, not the old ones. In other words, learn from the old ones. And the second condition is Learn how to apologize. Learn how to say, I'm sorry. In life, we're not perfect. We're not called on to be perfect. We're called on to be accountable. And the difference is drastic. In fact, our imperfections in life are essentially what make us so wonderful human. Because what's the difference of pre-creation and post-creation? Pre-creation, there was perfection. God is perfect. So why did he create humans? If he wanted perfection, he had much of it before creation, an abundance of perfection, an infinite perfection. Why create humans? Because God wanted imperfection. Or to put it more precisely, he cherished and appreciated the journey from imperfection towards deeper growth and deeper awareness and deeper realization and deeper discovery. So the next time you discover an imperfection in your life, instead of whining or wallowing in the quagmire of despair over yet another imperfection, you should actually start singing and celebrating the fact that now you could fulfill the purpose of being human. The purpose of being human is not to be perfect. God is much more perfect than everybody, and you were more perfect before you were born. The whole purpose of life, the Balatanya writes in the Kudatari Parshas Bullock, he says, why was the world created? So he says, there's many, many reasons given. Why did the soul come down to this world? In Sfarim, there are many, many reasons. He says, Hatiru Tzahamiti. The ultimate, the truest reason is to become a Baal The reason the soul came down to this world is to become a Baal To become from the state of a Tzadik to the state of a Baal What's the meaning of this? A Tzadik represents the person who lives in a perfect oasis of divinity and spirituality and holiness. The Baal represents the profile of the person who discovers truth from failure, who discovers light from darkness, who discovers depth from superficiality. When the soul comes into this world, by definition, it is transformed from a tzaddik into a Baal That's the ultimate purpose of why the soul comes down here. Which is why I find it strange that Balei Tshuva want to fit in so much to FFBs. When really the purpose is the FFBs should try to become Balei Tshuva. 
So the first step of the Manishtan Alayla Azem Mikol Halaylis is all nights we eat chametz and matzah. We vacillate between two states of consciousness. Sometimes we'll eat a little matzah, but the primary staple is chametz. And even if it's not the primary staple, it's allowed. Tonight, we vanish, we banish, we expel the last iota of chametz. Chametz becomes the arch enemy of the Jewish people on Pesach. It's almost a strange phenomenon. One night before, everybody was eating and enjoying chametz, and the next night, chametz becomes enemy number one in Jewish life, as though this poor chametz tried to destroy the world. Because in order to be able to experience the energy of Pesach, the first thing is kulei matzah. If I can go into a state of complete openness to growth, how many of us are capable of that? To be able to sit down, open myself up and say, I am open to revisit everything. I am open to absolute transformation. Nothing is stuck. No status quo, no defense mechanisms. You could tell me anything and I will try not to become defensive. Now of course the Chomets will right away want to become defensive and say, who are you to tell me about this? But as long as I can, as long as I can identify it and choose to identify with the matzah dimension, with the matzah value in me, that makes this night different than all other nights. Complete and absolute humility, also identified as bittel, which means the nullification of any need for haughtiness, pompousness, arrogance, narcissism, being right, being just, but rather complete openness to truth without any protective gear. This is the first thing you need to make sure is happening by the Seder. <laughs> There's no protective gear. No, no responses coming from the need of developing these strong defense mechanisms that I have because I'm afraid to lose myself in this battle. Real humility comes from ultimate confidence where you know that you're one with the divine at your core and therefore you could be open to every type of change and transformation and you won't get hurt. You won't get destroyed in the process. That's the first thing your child tells you that makes this night different than any other nights. And if you listen this year to your child saying it, you'll actually hear this. As adults, it's hard to listen to children. We listen to children as adults or as therapists. We focus very much, you know, when children say the Manashtan and you watch them grow up, and if you remember yourself, you could really see the transitions from childhood to adulthood. There's when you're three years old and four years old and everybody's nudging you to say the Manashtana and you absolutely refuse. They'll be ready to give you the Brooklyn Bridge and, this, and the Tappan Zee Bridge, but the three-year-old, four-year-old just makes like this. They say, come, say, and instead mommy says the Manashtana instead of little boy, that stage, that's that stage. Then there's the stage where you have the cute little angels who are so excited, the five or six or seven, eight-year-olds, and they stand up on the chair, and with utmost seriousness and sincerity, they recite the Manishtana, and it's really a highlight of their year and a highlight in the lives of the parents watching it. Then as they get older, we see the self-consciousness growing. And at the age of Bar Mitzvah, a little younger, a little older, there's this awkwardness. The awkwardness, right, you remember? <laughs> of what this one is saying and that one is saying. And then when you're a teenager, there's the self-consciousness of, oh, now it's a whole experience of me saying the Manishtana. And then when you become an adult, and if you still say the Manishtana, there is the maturity and the seriousness, sometimes taking yourself too seriously. And then as you grow up and you develop maybe a little more of a spiritual maturity and sensitivity, you look at it in different eyes. But it really... It, uh, it, uh, it highlights, it delineates the journey, the journey of people from a very young age to an older age. But when we could listen to the child 
on their terms, not on our terms, without preconceived notions, without prerequisites, without expectations. This is the first statement they're making. There's a second statement they're making. What makes this night different is all night we eat, all year we eat vegetables. Tonight we eat and we focus on one vegetable more, bitter herbs. What makes this night different is I'm ready to fill my mouth and experience a mouthful of bitter horseradish. There's nothing like a mouthful of bitter horseradish to get your heart pounding and your taste buds triggered. What does this mean? It means some of us in life shut the faucet. And the reason we shut the faucet is because the water that comes out is often too painful. The problem is the moment you shut the faucet, or even those of us who go down to the boiler and close the water, we don't allow any water to come out of our faucet. You know what I'm talking about? No, I'll explain. Some of us, at a certain point in life, shut the faucet of our emotions. We felt we had to. The pain was too profound to keep the water running. As children, we're brilliant, so we go down to the boiler system of our psyche. It's called the sub, sub, sub conscious layers in the lower stratums of your personality. And you find the switch to emotions. And you go, boop. And that's how you survive. If you don't allow yourself to experience all emotions of life, you won't experience so much pain. You create a certain detachment. We go into a robotic or mechanical state. We do what we have to do. We want to survive. We want to function. But we can't allow ourselves to experience the full gamut of life's emotions. Because if we do that, we may not stop sobbing. So we just shut the water, and we find we buy bottled water in the store when we need to. The problem is, once I shut the faucet, I shut the faucet of all emotions. I don't feel pain, but I can't feel joy. I may not feel hate, but I can't feel love. I may not feel despondency, but I can't feel excitement. I may not feel death, but I can't feel life either. I may not feel the disappointments of disconnections, but I can't feel the profound exhilaration of connections. I may not feel the abuse of alienation and detachment, but I also can't feel the vigor and power of presence and attachment. I may not feel and grieve the depth of the mourning over the lost relationship and the lost expectations. But I also can't celebrate anymore the sparks of love and life that exist in my life. I shut my water channel. I shut my faucet. And when that happens, the I is not alive. The I has been hidden somewhere very, very deep. Because the I of the person is all about our emotions, our experiences, our spontaneous reactions, our relationships. When we become a computer, we may do everything right, but there's nobody there. There's no presence. So what makes this night different? I fill my mouth with horse I fill my mouse with my mouth with horse radish to be able to feel bitterness. Who wants to feel bitterness? Why are you taking the bitter peel? Because in order to be able to feel the joy, I have to be able to feel the bitterness. Now this is an extraordinary profound, but it's not an easy insight to digest. We dip it a little bit with charoises. But then we shake off the charoises. And the reason it's not easy to digest is because it's murr. <laughs> murr is not easy to digest. But here's the paradox. If I can't taste my murr, I can't taste my wine. If I can't taste my murder, I can't taste my freedom. If I can't taste my murder, I cannot go out of Egypt. My whole life will not become murder by tasting murder. What tasting murder does is it gives me the courage to open my taste buds, to trigger my emotions, to be able to feel, and yes, to be able to cry. 
And when I lie, I allow myself to cry, that the water becomes like a mikveh, the tears become like a mikveh, that wash me out and open me up to all the joy that also exists in my life. So some people, with some people it's not so complicated on a conscious level. Sometimes the mara represents simply, I'm indifferent. I don't feel anything. Some people, they're just indifferent. It's like a form of cynicism. You don't want to be disappointed, so you just stop feeling. You just become indifferent. They once asked a Jew, what's the difference between apathy and ignorance? And he said, I don't know and I don't care. When I don't care about things, nothing bothers me. Sometimes you hear people, eh, I don't care, I don't care, I'm indifferent. And some people admire them. Wow, nothing gets to you. No, nothing negative gets to you, but nothing positive also gets to you. Indifference, real indifference, spells disaster. Because I'm indifferent to everything. I'm indifferent to things that I should be indifferent to, but I become indifferent to everything else too. Apathy is not an option in life. Apathy is an option for the fearful, for the cowards, just like cynicism. Cynicism sometimes sounds sophisticated. People who are cynical of everybody and anything. There's no innocence in their life, but it's really because I don't want to get disappointed again. When I have been disappointed too many times, I become cynical to everybody and everything because I don't want to get backstabbed. How many times can Julius Caesar get a dagger in their chest? How many times can a person experience a dagger and therefore you stop believing, you stop trusting, and you stop feeling? You become indifferent and you're always safe. The only problem is you're also dead. A Jew once told me, he lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So he grew up in uh, Rhode Island, I believe. And he told me that in Rhode Island there was an Altayid, an old Jew. And he was a type of Jew, like an old American Jew. He knew no nonsense. Like in the middle of davening, if by Chazar Sashat somebody was talking, and he was the Chazan, he would turn around and tell the person to be quiet. He was an interesting character. So this Jew, his name is uh, Mr. Estrin, told me that uh, he remembered a story <laughs> that happened in, with him in 1927 that he shared with this Jew who told it to me. He was driving in one of those cars, you know, those old Ford, uh, Henry Ford models from the 1920s, you know what those cars looked like. And he was in an accident. In an accident. And uh, he went into a comatose, he was unconscious, and he was outside of the car on the, on the street. This was 1927, the police came to examine him. They didn't have the tools that they have today. They declared him dead on sight. And they shipped him off to the morgue. He was unconscious. In the morgue, the freezers, thank God, were full. So they kept him on a stretcher until one of the freezers would open up, and they would put him into the freezer until the body would be claimed. So he's on one of the beds, one of the stretchers, and then one of the freezers becomes vacant. So as he puts it, there was a holy African-American brother who was tending to the morgue. Big, big fellow. And it's time to take this body and put it into the freezer. So he starts rolling his stretcher into the, to the freezer. And at that point, this Jew, the Chazan of Rhode Island, wakes up. He wakes up, and he sticks his head out. And he sees, it looks like just like Elam Haba, he sees a huge African-American holy brother standing right above him, wheeling the stretcher. And remember, he was without his garments in this morgue. Just a little sheet. And a morgue is cold, <laughs> very cold. So he looks up at this African-American holy brother and he says, I'm cold, I'm cold. The man looks at him and says, you ain't cold, you dead. <laughs> but this was a profound lesson in life. Coldness, apathy, indifference is the lack of courage to be able to live. To live means to experience life in all of its, to experience life in all of its fluctuations, to experience life, the entire spectrum of colors, the entire electromagnetic force of life that encompasses the entire rainbow of a person's life, that's what it is. So I could love fully, then I could live fully. But in order to love fully, I have to be able to feel my capacity to love. 
And that means I have to be able to eat marer also. So eating of the marer is there to shake up a person from their indifference, to be able to really tune in to their experiences and their full set of emotions. The Egyptians made Jewish life bitter. They felt the bitterness of life. Because they felt the bitterness of life, they can yearn for liberation. They can yearn for emancipation. They can yearn for transformation. If all I do in life is I walk around like this, Baruch Hashem, everything is beautiful, sweet. He punch me in my face. All I do, there's an expression the Kotzke Rebbe once said, You're not, the Pesach says in Vayikra, don't offer as an offering to God, Sa'ir and Dvash. Sa'ir in Yiddish is Zoyer take. I said last week. Sourdough. Zoyer take. Dvash is honey, honey. So he says, Kol Sa'ir v'chol Dvash. Tzu Zoyer und Tzu Zis. There are people who are always sour and there are people who are always sweet. Both of them can be offered as an offering to God. Don't be always sour and don't be always sweet. I don't mean don't be always sweet to be uh, obnoxious and selfish. Sweet I mean as... Uh, huh? It's like a false sugary demeanor that is detached from the texture of life. So of course... A person should always be sweet. We should always be sweet <laughs> and kind. I didn't mean you should be um, uh, tough and rough and, and, and obnoxious and self-centered. That's not what I was saying. What I mean by sweetness is we create a false uh, external facade that deprives us from any real relationship, relationship with, with ourself. Now, of course, there's a big advantage. They once did an experiment with uh, forcing people to smile with pencils in their mouth. And it showed that the physical smile actually affected their moods. Because our external behaviors affect our internal behaviors. But that's not, based, that's not connected with falsehood. That's a conscious choice where my value in life is I want to be a happy person. But not because I cut off and I mutilate a certain part of myself and ignore it because what that does me that what that does is it substitutes my humanness with an artificial humanness. The person has to be able to feel the pain, including pain of mistakes, pain of abuse, pain of distortions, pain of certain realities that we either did by ourselves or have been done to us. And it's from that murder that I can grow. The, the Sfasemis writes, it says in Parshas Va'era, Hashem says, V'hoitseisi eschem mitachas sivlois mitzrayim. I am going to extract you from the sivlois of mitzrayim. The opening of Va'era. What's sivlois mitzrayim? So the word sivlois is usually translated as pains, suffering, he says a fascinating interpretation. The word sivlois in Hebrew comes from the word lisbol. Savlanut. You know what savlanut is? Patience. If you go to Israel, savlanut, savlanut, habibi. Patience, savlanut. We have in Hebrew lisbol. This person knows how to? To contain Lisbon, they, they can carry a lot. Chamor Lisbon, a donkey knows how to carry a lot. Says the Svasemes, Voitseisi Eschem Metacha Sivlis Mitzrayim. I'm going to take you out from a position in which you're tolerating Egypt. Because as long as you're tolerating Egypt, you will make peace with Egypt. Mitacha sivlois, not from the pain of Egypt, from the savlanut of Egypt, from the sivlois, Lisbon, the ability for you to be civil, say it's fine, put another washing machine on my head. Another smack, come on, another one, another one, another one. I remain in Egypt and I'm not doing anybody a favor. I'm not doing myself a favor, I'm not doing anybody else a favor because as long as I remain stuck in Egypt, people around me are also stuck in Egypt. 
So even as a martyr, I'm not doing anybody a favor. A person has to be able to get fed up with Mitzrayim. They have to be able to say, Daloi Mitzrayim, Daloi Golos, no more. That's for the Russian contingency. Daloi means in Russian, Dayenu, enough. <laughs> Daloi Golos, enough subjugation. When people can internally and externally scream against an injustice, that's how it seizes. People who tolerate injustice, people who tolerate abuse, people who tolerate lies and deception, they're not doing anybody a favor. They are accomplices to the crime because they guarantee that there's no change. When people think that silence and surrender and acquiescence in the face of injustice is a righteous thing to do, it's the exact opposite. That's what lets criminals of all types get away with their dirty work. That people look and say, Oi, what's up to Oi? Don't say Oi. <laughs> that's what martyr is. And mar- mar- that's why martyr is bitter. It's bitter. <laughs> this is the second thing your child tells you. If you listen carefully, you'll hear it. Your child tells you something else. All other nights, we don't dip even once. Tonight, we dip twice. The carpus and the salt water, the mara and the charasis. Matbilin is the word. Dip. Like the word tevila, which is a mikveh. Submerging. You become submerged in something. Somebody is tevil in a mikveh. What does it mean? The entire body goes into it. We put the carpus in the salt water, like in a mikveh. We put the mara in the charasis. We dip tevila. All other nights were not necessarily present. Halayla hazeh. Einan matufam. Halayla hazeh shteipam. Tonight we're present. Not just once, twice. With our bodies and with our souls. One of the greatest obstacles that people have to living is the absence of presence. Of being fully present wherever I am and whoever I am right now. And as a result of that, I often forfeit the magic of all that life has to represent. Now let's face it, there's always something to worry about. We all know the text of the ancient Jewish telegram. Start worrying, details to follow. There's always a tomorrow. Tomorrow is Bdikas Chametz, tomorrow is Erev Pesach, tomorrow is Pesach, tomorrow is Abba Mitzvah, Chassan, Apshan, Shapidin, Aben, Abris. Tomorrow is Camp, tomorrow is Rosh Hashanah, tomorrow is Yom Kippur, tomorrow is Chanukah, tomorrow is Purim. Where are we now? Tomorrow is Pesach. There's always a tomorrow and the day, today becomes defined by the tomorrow or by yesterday. What happened yesterday? The ability of the free person is to be able to be fully, fully present in life, right here, right now. So we say, sometimes, I'm ready to dip in. What do I mean dip in? Completely get involved. Completely get submerged. Not allow my thoughts to take me away and to distract me from the experience that I'm experiencing right now in life. Now this is difficult, because on our mind, there's always so much going on. Right now, you may thinking of, what are you thinking about right now? Anybody? This, oh. <laughs> Our minds are all over the place very often. And it looks like that's the responsible way to live. I'm not living in an isolated planet with nothing to do. I have a life to govern. I have a family to run. I have a home. I have a business. I have a flight. I have this responsibility, that responsibility. How can I even be here? As a result of that, we're often nowhere. We're always, many of us, are always somewhere else. Physically, I may be here. Mentally, I'm somewhere else. You ever see how a politician shakes hands with people? 
They look at the next person. When I visited Dublin, Ireland, many years ago, I went to the parliament. So there was a Jewish parliament member in Dublin, Ireland. His name was Frisco. Something like that. I don't remember. Huh? What was his last name? Frisco. Bliss, huh? One was a mayor and his brother was a parliament member. The mayor has passed away already, but the parliament member I met. So when I gave him Shalom Aleichem, he looked me in the eyes for a few seconds. So I said, I'm impressed with you, Mr. Briscoe. Most politicians, they already look away. So he told me that John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy, came here a few months before he was shot, or a year before, which was in the early 60s. And he shook, shook, shook his, my hand and he looked at me. And he didn't stop looking. And he said, Kennedy told me that. That when you shake somebody's hand, look them in the eyes. He says, that's what a politician has to do to gain trust. <laughs> so that itself was part of politics. <laughs> Perhaps. But it's true in every, so, many, so many other areas in life. The person is always somewhere else. It's very hard to be completely submerged. What makes this night different is, I take my body, my physical body, but I also take my mind my soul, and both of them become fully present. Because if I'm not fully present, I could never extract what there is from life at this moment. Full presence means, right now, this is what's going on, and there's absolutely nothing else. Va'avadetem meheira, we say in Kriya Shema, and there's the old Hasidic interpretation, va'avadetem meheira, you have to lose the sense of meheira. Fast, fast, fast. Get it over with. Just get it over with. Next, next, next. The most important person in my life is the person I'm speaking to right now. The most important moment in my life is the moment I'm living right now. The most important experience in my life is the experience that I'm experiencing right now. And the most important place in my life is the place I am right now. It's in the now where man finds God, where man finds life, where a person finds truth. Because the world is recreated every single moment. We say in Davening, So if I'm not here present, I am detaching myself from the heartbeat of life. I am not dancing to the rhythm of the divine vibrations through the cosmos and through my own self at this very moment. If I'm living in yesterday, or yesteryear, or tomorrow, God is like, hello, hello, I'm talking to you now. Come, wake up. Be attentive to me, to life, to experience, to opportunity. Right now, right here at this very moment. It doesn't mean I shouldn't learn from the past. It doesn't mean I shouldn't prepare for the future. We're preparing for Pesach. <laughs> I'm not going to have matzah if I don't prepare for Pesach. I'm going to have chametz if I don't do b'dikas chametz. Of course, we prepare and we learn. But we live. We live in the present moment. If I want to be free, my manishtana, your child says, dip, submerge yourself. Be completely, completely present. When a person is fully present, you can achieve in three minutes what you can't achieve in three hours when you're not fully present. There's a conversation you can have with a person for one minute, and if you're fully present, it's a life changer. And when you're not, you could sit seven hours and it's garnished. You make a very good point. You make a very good point. She said that she thought her whole life that these ideas are Buddhist ideas because she never heard them as Jewish ideas. In Tanya, there's a whole section, the second section of Tanya, the portal of unity and faith. The opening chapter is the Baal Shem Tov taught that the world is recreated every single moment anew. Life happens every single, the heartbeat of life you can only experience in the now. There's a slonim of art, of one of the slonim Rebbe said. We say in the Haggadah 
Mitchila Oiv de Avoy de Zara Hoyo Avesenu, Va Achshav Kervonu Hamakam La Avoydasa. In the beginning, we were, uh, our forefathers worshipped idols, and today God brought us close to His service. Why do we have to start gossiping about our forefathers in the Haggadah? That's not so nice. My father used to be a this, a this, a this, a this. Ah, ich bin amen. Do that with your therapist. You have to tell all your kids about your father. <laughs> Sit with your therapist. Tell them about your father. <laughs> the pshat is, mitchila. Listen to the words. Mitchila. People who live with the philosophy of life, of mitchila, what was, that's a philosophy that is not connected to God's worship. That's idolatry. Those who live in Achshav and now, that means they're in a relationship with God, serving Him. It, huh? The Slana Merebbe. The first Slana Merebbe. Mitchila is a philosophy of Eidazara. What was, was, was. I'm always there. And remember, the good old days were always good. You know that. Always better, beautiful, perfect. <laughs> An old man once told me, he said, the good old days, they were horrible. Because <laughs> they were horrible. <laughs> of course you learn from the good old days. You always learn from the past. If we don't learn from the past, we repeat the past errors, the famous saying. But a person who lives only in the past, I'm not alive. I live either with guilt or with regret or with horrible animosity and resentment, or just with nostalgia. Somebody once told me, eh, nostalgia today is not even what it used to be, look, be like. Va'achshav, <laughs> somebody who lives in the now, keivonu hamokim la'veidaseh. What does it mean that you're, how do you know, what's the litmus test, that you're in a relationship with God? Three things. We say it every morning in davening from Tehillim, in Haidu. Oiz v'chedva bimkoimai. In his space, there is confidence and there's joy. When you're in a space of confidence and joy, you're in his space. And here we learn a third component, achshav. When you're in the now, you're in the space of the divine. You're in the space where the divine is manifested. When I am in right now, right here, because right now there's purpose, right now there's meaning, right now there's a calling. Right now there's an energy to be grasped. Right now there are sparks to be liberated. Right now there's an opportunity for growth. Right now. The now may be a challenging moment. The now may be an exhilarating moment. The now may be a frustrating, it's a difficult situation. But there's something here right now, don't run. Something to learn, something to discover, a, per, a way to go deeper into something, something to realize. But there's always a way forward. From now there's always a way forward. That's the third statement your child tells you by the Manishtana, what sets this night different than all other nights. And then there's the fourth statement your son, your son or your daughter tell you. What makes this night different is all nights of the year, we sit or we recline. We could recline like kings, like queens, like princesses, or we could sit like dutiful, obedient people at the table. Everybody is stretched out. Everybody is reclining. Everybody is a queen. Everybody is a king. As the Gemara says, everyone is emancipated. What does this mean? What makes this night different is your awareness of how much you're capable of stretching, of how much you're capable of reclining. Just as it is when it comes to physical stretching. Those of you who are familiar with it know that the greatest trainers in the world, the best teachers, are those who teach you how much you're capable of stretching. Which not all of us, we like to quetch. I can't. If you do this, you're going to pull my brain out. If you do this, I'm going to lose my stomach, my heart, my kidneys. You're taking out my liver, you're pulling off my toes. Those are the rigid fears that comes because our bodies become so rigid, they're not flexible. A good stretcher helps you realize how naturally the body is so flexible. Children, right, before they introduced all the video games, they came home every evening for supper black and blue. They fell off trees, they climbed trees like monkeys, they fell off trees like monkeys. 
the flexibility, the elasticity, right? The elasticity of the body is extraordinary. But today in neuroscience, we know about brain elasticity as well. And that's the reclining we're talking about. There's the physical stretch, which is very, very important as well. It's the conduit for the spiritual stretch. And there's the spiritual reclining. The spiritual reclining means people don't realize how much power and flexibility and potency and prowess we have stored in our souls and in our brains. So we sometimes sit, we don't move, we don't budge. You're a free person. Free people recline. They stretch out physically, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually. Because even the sky is not the limit when you realize that your soul is a piece of the divine. And just as the divine is untouchable, invincible, wholesome, and limitless, the soul, which is a chelik eleikamimal, is also limitless. And therefore, even though we tell ourselves, this is who I am, this is who I'm going to remain, tonight, kolonom esubin, I'm stretched out, I'm reclined. And become free. Who is the one who tells us all of these four messages? Children. Why not adults? The answer is very simple. Children not only believe what I said, they live everything I just said. Children are humble. They're all matzah. They listen to everything. They absorb everything. Like wet sponges, they take in everything, which is often a problem. As adults, we discriminate. This I like, this I don't like, right? You sit at a shear, you don't like what I say, you shut down. If you're sitting at a shear, okay, not mine, you're sitting at a shear, and you don't like what the teacher is saying, what do you do? No way. <laughs> no way. I'm not taking this in. Boom, you dismiss it, you reject it. You can even see the sour face that you make. Not you, somebody else could see the sour face. Children take everything in. Sometimes they take in too much. That's their, that's their challenge, but that's their beauty. There's an absolute humility with children. They don't have defense mechanisms that we have erected to protect ourselves. It all goes in. That's why they remember everything. It's shocking. You sometimes hear your four-year-old, ten years later, they'll tell you what you told him when he was four, that you already forgot it. Seven years ago you forgot the story. But they absorb, they remember, because they listen, because there's you, complete openness. Complete openness to life. Complete curiosity. The second thing is murder. Children feel emotion. That's why they scream a lot. They cry a lot. They laugh a lot. They feel emotion. Of course, many of them learn pretty fast. Shh. And shh sometimes doesn't only mean on the outside. Also on the inside. So children, what's crack just to? You're eating mud already. You can wait for the same. <laughs> but that was a good, a good, uh, that was synchronized very well with where we were holding. Now we're doing the third one. Children are very present. They're present. They see something that attracts their attention. You're in a rush. You have a chasana. You're two and a half hours late. But your child saw something, and that's it. Life stops here. This is where it's at. I'm busy. What this one is going to say, I'm late for this, I'm late. What late? Wherever you are, that's where life is. Children are fully present. It's hard for us sometimes to be as present as they are because we're in a rush but they're fully, fully present. So they can teach us about Matbilin. A few years ago, the Washington Post did an extraordinary experiment. 2007. They took the, one of the greatest violinists alive today. His name, Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell is a Jewish kid, brilliant violinist, probably gets fifty dollars or $100,000 for a concert, maybe a half, maybe $200,000, and tickets in the front row cost a few thousand dollars. And they took Joshua Bell and they asked him, 
to put on clothes of a homeless beggar, a torn cap, and take his Stradivarius violin and play it in the metro, in the subway station in Washington, D.C. at 8 o'clock in the morning on a lousy Friday winter day in January as lawyers and doctors and entrepreneurs and accountants and professionals and all types of people, students and academics, parents and children, are going to work, going to school, going wherever they have to get in D.C. and play a concerto in the subway. And Joshua Bell agreed. And he dressed with torn clothes. He has a violin that's worth today probably $25 million or so in the subway. And he's sitting there. And he's not just playing uh, Yankee, uh, uh, the <laughs> Yankee Doodle. He's playing magnificent, magnificent symphonies, extraordinary, and he has a little paper cardboard box for people to put in, for people to put in donations. And he sits there for close to an hour. And I watched, they took a secret video. He played some of the most uh, extraordinary, exquisite pieces of music. A night before he did a concert, people were paying thousands of dollars. They wanted to see the Zelbe bell, the same bell, the same violin, the same music, the same art, the same genius, the same creativity. <laughs> and it's unbelievable what they saw. Out of thousands and thousands of people, almost nobody stopped. Maybe seven, eight people stopped for a minute. At the end, he made a dollar and 32 cents or so. But there was one demographic that stopped. You know who? Child. Children. All children stopped, but they were yanked away by their parents. Each one, each child turned around until mommy said, we got to go, you're going to be late. And they kept on turning around. You know how children turn around, turn around? Children sensed that there was something unique. Adults are busy. There was one black African-American janitor in a cafeteria, a, a kiosk, a newspaper kiosk, in the subway. And he made sure to clean outside the store to be able to have his eye on this. They asked Bell, what was the hardest part? He said, when I finished, nobody noticed. <laughs> when I finished, nobody noticed. I went on to the next one. He finished. It was a masterpiece. Somebody, hey! Nobody noticed. Besides the children. But they weren't in control. They were yanked. They were yanked away. And then I discovered, I think we discovered, a great truth about life. And that is, art without a frame often becomes meaningless. And it shows you how pathetic the sophisticated human can become. If it's not advertised as art, if it's not framed as art, it becomes meaningless. Very few people pick up art without a frame. If it's a concert, if everybody's dressed to kill, if you're paying 2,000 bucks, ooh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was unbelievable. Liar. Shaiti diot was the best. The next morning, the same guy. You're in a rush. We love frames. We love commercials. We love advertisements. If you tell me it's beautiful, it becomes beautiful. If you don't tell me it's beautiful, it's nothing. It's meaningless. How many things in life do people lose on because there's nobody to frame it? It's all the frame, the frame. I have to be told to appreciate. If there's no frame, it's worthless. That's not where art is. Most art is frameless. Most art is in the present moment. Most art is in the most boring, monotonous experiences if you just have the courage to listen and to look. That's why it's the children who teach you about humility. They teach you about feeling. They teach you about presence. Presence. 
and they teach you about the fact that they believe they can do anything. Sometimes they believe they can do too much, and they need Tati and Mommy to hold them back. But children, naturally, of course I'm going to jump off. <coughs> of course I'm going to jump two floors. Of course I'm going to do this. Of course I'm going to do that. Children have this innate drive and ability to exercise their potentials fully. Ad infinitum. So it's the child who says, Manishtana halayla azamikol halaylas. What makes this night different? And the four questions are both four questions and four answers and most importantly, four invitations, four challenges. Have a wonderful week. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.